Welcome to Hacienda Santa Maria Regla. Have you ever been to an 18th century hacienda? Right here, very close to the magic town of Huasca de Ocampo, Pedro Romero de Terreros, seeing that the mountainous terrain of Real del Monte was an obstacle to building haciendas for the benefit of silver, between 1760 and 1780, built the haciendas of Santa Maria, San Francisco Javier, San Miguel, and San Antonio, all of Rey. In the 18th century, the need arose to build haciendas for the benefit of silver from the bonanza of the Veta de Vizcaína, whose benefits were fully and widely enjoyed by Pedro Romero de Terreros, as flat extensions were required for it to take place. This is going to be a great adventure. Romero de Terreros decided to carry out the project, which begins the great development of the region, giving jobs to hundreds of workers, first to build them and then to operate them at full capacity. Today, the hacienda retains a large part of its patios and was transformed into a colonial-style hotel with 51 rooms. It has a chapel, a garden with capacity for up to 600 people, an artificial dam, meeting rooms, and offers its spaces for all kinds of events. The Hotel Hacienda Santa Maria Regla is located in the middle of this spectacular landscape that in turn represents one of the 13 natural wonders of Mexico, the basaltic prisms, video that you can find in the description box, and the famous Rose Waterfall, painted in 1803 by Alexander von Humboldt exhibited at the British Art Museum in London. It is one of the most impressive man-made constructions during the 18th century. It was built by Don Pedro Romero de Terreros, the Count of Regla. The chapel of the Hacienda Santa Maria Regla has a Baroque-style facade. Some other attractions are the aqueduct and the dungeon, where in other times, smallpox and measles patients were locked up. In this old construction, there are also labyrinths and secret tunnels that were used many years ago for the transportation of silver and gold. And if you find a tour guide, you can access several of them. I should also mention that Romero de Terreros, from an early age, showed exceptional intellectual abilities and, as he could not benefit from family entailment, his parents considered that he pursue ecclesiastical studies. At the age of 22, he sailed for New Spain at the request of his uncle, Juan Vázquez de Terreros, a prominent citizen of Santiago de Querétaro. Pedro took control of his uncle's businesses, which were in decline, and turned them profitable very quickly. Perhaps Pedro would have nothing more than his intellectual capacities. That's what he had in his hands. And with this, he became, listen to this, one of the wealthiest men of his time. But you may think that things came easily to Pedro and the opportunities fell from the sky. In that case, let me give you another, somewhat more extreme example. But before, let me ask you something. What about you? What do you have in your hands? Now, let me share this story with you. About 3,300 years ago, an 80-year-old man was given a monumental task. He was supposed to free an oppressed people from the enslaving chains of one of the most powerful empires that have existed on the face of the earth. To give you a little bit of context, Moses, sentenced to death even before he came out of his mother's womb, son of a slave, rescued by the princess daughter of the Pharaoh. He lived the first part of his life as royalty, sharing and enjoying the highest privileges that any person of that time could have enjoyed. This same Moses, who tasted the life of a prince, saw in a single instant everything vanished before him, 
in fear and again sentenced to death by the same family that had rescued him from imminent death, he fled from everything he had to go to a deserted, remote, and unknown place. In that place he went from being royalty to being a shepherd of his father-in-law's flock. Speaking of radical changes, Moses went from having jewels in his hands and the power to command and order as he pleased with the comforts most desired by any human being to having a shepherd's staff in his hand. That's all, that's it, just a staff. The story goes that Moses, at that old age, and probably without much encouragement to perform great feats for the rest of his life, is called by God himself, to which Moses makes endless excuses. Yes, just as it sounds, God assigning Moses a task and him making excuse after excuse. Moses did not think he was capable of carrying out such a colossal task. God had given him specific instructions on how absolutely everything was going to happen, down to the last detail. But Moses said, And who am I to appear before Pharaoh and take your people out of Egypt? That is, you remember that I killed an Egyptian, and in Egypt they seek to kill me. I am an enemy of the state. I am the least suitable person to carry out this plan. And if that wasn't enough, I am a shepherd, something that the Egyptians greatly despised back then. Also, if I go, they will question me. They will surely doubt what I tell them. And how can I ever verify what you are telling me so that they believe me? They just won't believe me, period. It was then that one of the most important questions in history was asked, what do you have in your hand? A question that is both practical and probing. It is not that God doesn't know what you have in your hands. Rather, it is so that we realize and we are well aware of what we have. So either way, what is it that Moses had in his hand? A staff, his shepherd's tool. How regular, how ordinary. A representation of the failures of Moses, which we remember grew up in the royal palace, right? As a reminder of how bad things went. How did this happen? He wasn't supposed to be here. Now he's in a place that he never imagined and doing something that had never crossed his mind. How did he end up in this situation? We could be asking the same question. This is not how I planned out and I mapped out my life. His mistakes in Egypt took him from the palace to a place where he would find his mission. Moses' years as a shepherd would not be in vain. The time, energy, and effort that he had spent shepherding had put into his hands the very thing that Moses would use for the glory of God. God did not use the opulent scepter in Egypt that was in his royal hand, but he did use the unassuming shepherd's rod, which Moses had used for years in his past life. We are more likely to hear his voice in the pastures of life than in the palaces. Sometimes we have to find ourselves in unlikely and unimaginable places where we never thought we would be, so that we can hear the voice of God speaking to us clearly. God took somebody, turned into a nobody, and turned him into somebody using something that everyone thought was nothing. What you consider degradation, God uses for preparation. God can use what's in your hand to teach you something, not just use you in ways you never imagined. But wait, there's more. God's instruction for Moses was that he throw the rod to the ground. The moment Moses throws it, it turns into a snake. Yes, a snake. Pretty impressive, right? So whatever you have in your hand, when used within divine parameters, will become something extraordinary. So God tells Moses to pick up the snake. Moses has to pick up the snake without knowing what is going to happen, because God never said anything about it. 
God did not say that he would heal Moses in case he was bitten. So Moses had to do it in faith. But here's the best part. Moses was risking his life so that others might believe. Just remember that this whole thing is taking place so as to save an entire people. The main reason was for others to believe. In other words, Moses had to risk his own life, not for his own benefit. He was just fine herding sheep without anyone bothering him. But for the benefit of others, he had to make a decision. He could have said, well, I pass. There is no deal, God. I'm out of here. But no, Moses chose selflessly. He moved in faith, not knowing what was going to happen. And you and me, can we overcome our fear so that it can be the foundation of someone else's faith? What's in your hand? Seeing the staff does not necessarily represent your failures or your fears, but your future. The staff was not going to be useful only while Moses was in the desert, while he tended the flock. And God said, but take this staff in your hand so you can do great signs with it. What signs? What about parting the Red Sea? Make water flow from the rock? It ended up being called the rod of God. And guess what? It was already in the hand of Moses when he met God. You have God-given gifts, gifts that no one else has, in a world that urgently needs you. God has equipped you with everything you need to be light in this decaying world.